Good evening and a very warm welcome to the last seminar of the day. And Tuesday, it's uh, not too much into the festival yet, so I think you're still kind of okay. I'm <clears throat> already, I, I came here a little uh, deranged, maybe. But uh, let's get straight into it. It's packed and we have some, some great guests. Um, my name is Dirk Meyer. Uh, Kevin Shaw. And uh, I'm a member of the BVK and CSI. And uh, Kevin is... President of the Colorist Society, so welcome. And we came up with an idea, um, because we love the festival so much, to bring some great talent and ideas and knowledge to the audience here. And for that, we have very special guests. Uh, one is here with us in the audience, and two are online. So there are, I hope you recognize them. <laughs> Pascal Marin, French DP, next to me. And I have some, there is Ari Wagner. And there's Steve Yetlin. And we're currently spanning a time line, a time difference of 19 hours. Is that correct? Ari got up for us very early, I think. What's, what's time for you now? Uh, it is uh, very early, maybe 6.30 a.m. Okay. And you're also already, so she's in Wednesday, she's in the future for us already. So she's for it's Wednesday already. And Steve, it's about noon, to get noon, right? Yeah, yeah, it's noon here in Los Angeles, just before noon. Okay, when we quickly switch back to my, my slides, I'll say a few words. About all of you, um, but from the applause for them, I think you already know them. Steve Yedlin, director of photography, <clears throat> member of the AC, recently Glass Onion, Knives Out, Star Wars Episode 8. Um, Ari Wagner, director of photography. Actually, uh, the film Eileen was screened yesterday here at the festival because of some other event. I couldn't see it. Anyone who has seen it? Yeah. Any feedback you want to give? <laughs> yeah, she's not going to see that, but if you cry out, then... Yeah, I saw a couple of thumbs up, just to let you know. <laughs> and Pascal, French DP. <laughs> and you're also presenting on anamorphic lenses. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, here. An, another seminar about anamorphic. Yeah, when, where? Oh, to when? <laughs> on Thursday at 5 in Cinema City. Um, I think it's screening room number 10. You're welcome. Good. Kevin, as you said, um, besides being president of the Color Society, also head of Color Admission, and I myself am a colorist, I've been lecturing, and um, without further ado, I want to go back about, well, for me it was seven years, when I came to Camera Image 2016 and saw a presentation by Steve. Back then it was the resolution demo, but everything kind of started a year earlier in 2015 when he presented this I'm not going to show it completely, but has anyone seen that? Yeah, quite a lot of hands are going up, Steve. For me, the experience a year later, though, but I think it was probably similar to those who have witnessed it, it was qu quite striking, groundbreaking even. And I told you already personally, but I'm happy to repeat it here on stage, I was so grateful that at that time a DP came out and objectified the whole discussion of the film look and that a particular capture medium would be the only way to achieve a specific look. 
There had been so much discussion going on with mostly emotional language since the dawn, basically, of digital cinematography that made it very hard, also for me, my role as a colorist, to kind of have a common ground and starting point for a real discussion about what a look is. So, who hasn't actually seen that presentation, I highly recommend it. Get out your phones, click on the link that goes to an article on his website. You should first then watch the display prep demo and then read the article. That is actually something that I force till today. <laughs> Students, some of them here in the audience, I've seen them, during seminars about digital cinematography. And I thought I would actually love to have a talk with Steve about this, what's the situation eight years after, but also maybe discussing a few points that I, like questions that I always get from the students. And I made up my own mind, but um, maybe we can switch over to Steve's Zoom camera and actually start by discussing what do you feel like eight years later? Um, has it changed a lot? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I, re I really don't know. But then give us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it. Um, I mean, my presentation is actually related to some of the things that have changed that aren't necessarily better, but are just different. But I think, I, you know, I think there's, yeah, I don't think there's one, I mean, I, I can't tell because I'm just my own, I'm just a mm -hmm. cinematographer. I, I don't, I'm not like you as a colorist that works with a lot of different people, but from what I can tell, there is just drifting, <laughs> you know, th th you know, th you know, there's like, uh, yeah, transcontinental drift kind of things where there's people getting more, m more superstitious and, more zealotry, and then there's other people that are changing, and then there's new kinds of zealotry, and um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's just one big trend. That, that, you know, mm -hmm. um, things are changing, but not in one uh, monolithic direction. I think, but I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that actually it would be something to discuss with the audience more what, what they feel. But um, this one of the questions after having my students read and seen the demo and so on, they still struggle to get grip on the term display prep. Can you briefly, because you have many more interesting things to show yeah. tonight as well, can you, can you briefly just tell, like, how did you come up with this term, why? And yeah, well, it's pointedly supposed to not be technical or narrowly defined. Um, it's just supposed to be just a English language, um, you know, easy to understand descriptive phrase um, to, to break us out of a lot of the superstitions and preconceptions because, because those superstitions and preconceptions are tied to a lot of the, the, the technical or at least embedded language. Um, I, I just wanted to use a new word, like even if another word is correct, I just didn't want to use it because of all the baggage. And so it's just, it's really just meant to, 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 to jolt us out of, um, you know, the, the rut of thinking um, that, that, you know, that posits all of these things as important leverage points, except for the one thing that is the most important leverage point um, in, in uh, image rendering. Mm -hmm. And I thought about going more into the categories that you describe for um, image attributes, but I think you'll do that in your presentation anyway. Is there anything to say first, like how this idea with image attributes? I mean, I, I, I can talk about this also for quite a while, but um, yeah. since we have you here. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the one thing that I'll say before the, the presentation about it and, and for the people that haven't read the, um, that piece on the website, I think what you're talking about is just the breakdown of um, intrapixel, intrapixel, spatial and temporal and, um, you know, I never meant for those to be some kind of 
monolithic or or to somehow say they're even inherent. It's just more of a a way to, to, to categorize in your mind to, to be able just to be able to, to conceptualize and wrap your head around it better. Um, so it's just a way to kind of break down what the um, what the multiple attributes are. And then also when you're thinking about it differently, it helps it does help understand the pragmatic um, application because anything that's intrapixel, no matter how complicated, no matter what's going on, it can all be packed down into a LUT for, you know, pragmatically for interchange, whereas things that are spatial and temporal can't be packed down like that. Like even if there's some kind of an, a standardized inter interchange format like OFX, um, you know, it, it, there, it's still each one is sort of its own thing a little bit. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. So intrapixel, everything that only changes a pixel in itself, but is, is not influenced by anything around it or where actually the pixel in the picture is, right? Exactly, yeah, and, and intrapixel means, uh, in this case, it means um, transformation that happens based on only the incoming color of the pixel. So for example, if you're making a contrast, you're, you know, if, if the pixel coming in is dark, it's gonna get darker. You know, if you're making it bluer, the pixel, the, the triplet that's coming in is gonna get blue or red or whatever you're doing to it. Um, and it, it can't be affected by what's around it. So, you know, a flare or halation or grain, the, those are not intra, well, grain can be intrapixel actually, but, um, you know, flare or halation or blur, those are not intrapixel because you have to know what's next to the thing. And, and this concept of intrapixel is not specific to digital. It also applies to film uh, it's not the best word <laughs> because film doesn't have pixels, but there's, you know, film has attributes that are based solely on the, the light that's coming in and exposing it. And then has other attributes that are based on things that are around it in space or in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope that was enough of an introduction. So you can just take off with your Shall we begin? presentation. Okay. 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 Well, yeah. So, um, because we don't have very much time, uh, what Dirk asked me to do is I'm going to do sort of a case study of how I develop and go and, and vet um, and reality check my um, image rendering pipeline, both the LUT and the spatial temporal stuff. Um, but because of the time, uh, I mean, it's going to be a very, uh, you know, high view flyover. Um, but, the, but the one thing that I did want to, the sort of nugget that I did want to dig down a little bit in that I do think we have enough time to talk about and, and to speak about in a satisfying way is, uh, and you know, so what I wanna kind of wrap, wrap this whole bundle in is the, the idea of reality checking and um, you know, reality checking to get over placebo effect and confirmation bias. And um, for those of you that are familiar with the stuff on my website and, and to some extent how I do things, you know, there's gonna be some people uh, here tonight who, um, you know, are excited to dig in the way I do, even if not as far. There's going to be other people who think, you know, that's scary. I don't want to do that myself. I want to either partner up with somebody or I just want um, an off-the-shelf solution. You know, I don't want to figure it all out myself. And, and no matter where you are in that spectrum, um, the thing that's always going to apply is, though, this idea of reality checking, that whatever it is, whether you build it yourself from scratch, whether you build it yourself from a... Um, from a kit or whether you don't build it yourself at all, um, you know, whatever the pipeline is needs to be vetted and checked. And because of the sort of emotional way that people talk about things, as, as Dirk was mentioning, we're, we're often very susceptible to, to vendors and other people, you know, just using evocative language and, 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 you know, not actually reality testing. You know, somebody says the word you know, film is magic, or somebody says that this digital camera gets magical skin tones, or somebody says this camera has a lot of Ks. And, you know, we, you know, we're kind of trained to project what we imagine onto the image instead of, instead of really doing um, a thorough check. And um, so that's, that's when I want to kind of hang this, um, uh, you know, uh, drape the, the whole thing in as we do a quick flyby of um, how I do uh, how I prep my stuff. And, um, you know, uh, also for the people that are familiar with um, some of my materials and stuff on my website and talks I've done, um, you know, I, I think you know that I've 
um, advocated against um, this kind of um, empty zealotry where that's basically just brand allegiance. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, again, I'll just the, you know, whether it's film is magic, whether it's, uh, you know, red has the magic Kodak, whether it's only airy has the, the cinematic skin tones, um, you know, or some vendor says, you know, we've got the special uh, color science built right into the sensor, whatever these things that are meant to be evocative and don't really say anything are. Um, and, and, you know, so, so uh, hopefully, or whatever, there's already some awareness that I've advocated against that. But one of the things, uh, to go back to Dirk's question about how have things changed, um, I think one of the things that's a little bit unfortunate is that there's, there's been um, a growing camp, it's by no means everybody, but there is a camp that sort of uh, superficially positions itself in the exact opposite of that sort of zealotry, um, you know, that, that basically says, yeah, we don't need, we don't need uh, film or uh, anything special like that because these computers can do anything now and they have a lot of buttons and knobs on them so we can make it look however we want. And the thing is that that take on it actually wraps all the way back, or it's not even an opposite take uh, that's problematic, it's actually the same take, it's, it's sort of empty zealotry because um, you, you still have to figure out what you're actually doing. Like the fact that uh, Resolve has a lot of buttons, knobs, and switches on it that can do a lot doesn't mean that you have figured out what you're gonna do with it. Um, you know, just like, uh, you know, I mean, my, uh, my computer keyboard here has enough buttons on it for me to write a great Ameri the great American novel, but that doesn't mean I have written a great American novel. You have to actually do something uh, with it, and it's not always easy to figure out what it is and to vet it and make sure that what, uh, what you're doing really is uh, thorough and what you intend. And, um, you know, and what that also means, is, and, and, and this goes not only to, uh, I mean, it, it very much goes to the, the quality and character of our final image rendering, but not only that, it also goes to how do we use our time because our time on set is so precious. We only have a certain amount of time with locations and actors and all the expensive gear and everything. And our time in color grading is precious. And if we, and if we squander it with a lot of um, troubleshooting and what's going on, I don't understand this. And you know, reinventing the wheel for stuff that this is already figured out, why are we starting from scratch every shot? Um, is just not a good use of time. So, um, so kind of the theme that I want to kind of hit on as I as I take you through this um, this uh, quick summary is this idea of always vetting, always assuming you've done <laughs> you've done something wrong, or it can be made better, or there's like there's there's a, there's something that needs to be fixed, um, uh, rather than uh, just uh, drinking the Kool Aid without asking any questions. Um, so let's so. Um, so let's look at the, some general development stuff and I'm going to go over sort of how I developed the stuff over years, like the big long development. And then, and then what do I do with that when I start one specific project? And, um, one of the absolute biggest things, uh, for this reality testing and for the develop, the long-term development and for the project-based development is something that anybody can do, even though, you know, I talked about that spectrum. Some of you are gonna to wanna to dive way in uh, like I do. Some people don't wanna, you know, uh, dive in at all. Some people are in the middle, but no matter where you are on that spectrum, one thing you can do for, for reality testing is to keep frames from movies. And I've been doing this for years now, and um, I have uh, full quality camera original, so completely uncompressed, ungraded, unleaded, camera original frames uh, from uh, the last bunch of movies I've done and um, other things. Um, I actually have some frames going back to as long as I've been shooting digital as opposed to film, um, but, uh, but specifically for the last, uh, I don't know how long, uh, eight years or so, um, I have frames from almost every shot in the movie um, but I also have a curated frames on my computer um, where I have like a couple hundred from every film. So I can go back and look at a film from years ago with a new LUT, for example, um, if I want to test it and, and to vet it. So, um, you know, and so this is a huge thing is having 
all these different circumstances. I've got stuff that's bright, dark, flat, contrasty, um, you know, things that are, that are uh, desaturated, saturated, every kind of lighting situation, you know, exteriors, interiors, you know, sunny, overcast, you know, you know, super saturated fire, um, you know, and it's always good whenever you're going to vet things to check it on all kinds of things, you know, I mean, here's, you know, caustic, you know, little teeny caustic brightnesses, you know, things that are flat, things that are saturated, um, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, vibrant, vibrant red that's, uh, you know, here's a vibrant red that's uh, reflective as opposed to emissive, you know, but here's, uh, sorry, you know, but there's also, we can also look at vibrant reds that are, that are, uh, that one was, that are emissive like that, or like this, like this, here, um, you know, so, so this is, you know, and then also, you know, um, you know, you can look at shots that have very nuanced skin tones compared to ones that have, you know, something much more blunt going on. Like this is a shot I always like to look at for, for more nuanced skin tones. So I have these hundreds of shots from, from tons of different um, scenarios. Um, and because they're full quality and ungraded and unleaded, I can go back and really test things on them. And um, so uh, just, to, just to look at some of this stuff and how I develop it, um, again, it's just gonna be a really quick summary, but let's first look at my color transformation computation stack. And just as a reminder for um, I probably, uh, you know, some of, some of you already know this and some of you don't, but even for the people that do, just to uh, put it firmly in the forefront of your mind instead of the back, is, you know, don't forget we, we, you know, we throw the word LUT around all the time, but what a LUT technically is versus what philosophically is, is two different things, because technically a LUT is just, is just a record of a transformation, um, but anything can be in it. Um, it can be good or bad or nuanced or not nuanced or, um, you know, um, you know, the analogy I like to give is a LUT is like a stack of white paper. It doesn't mean, it, you know, it can be blank, it can have a great novel on it, it can have a terrible novel, it can have a screenplay in it, it can have a, you know, a good screenplay, a bad screenplay, it can have all X's, it can say all work and no play makes Jack a good boy. You know, the, it, it's just a container. Um, and, and so that this is another one of the, the uh, things that, you know, about the uh, reality testing uh, that I mentioned, you know, which is, you know, don't fall for, you know, somebody says they have a lot, but what does that mean? You know, I mean, I, you know, I've seen it where somebody thinks, uh, a DP thinks somebody has made this incredibly nuanced lot and they're describing how it's this film stock in the shoulder and that film stock in the toe. And they give me the LUT and I look at it and it's basically the off the shelf standard uh, manufactured LUT with a tiny, tiny tweak on it that's barely visible. You know, so, um, so, so just a reminder, a LUT is just a container for a transformation. And this, this is the computation stack for, for my uh, color transformation stuff that I do. And it's, it's always evolving, it's never done because I am always reality checking, saying, how can I make it better? Um, and uh, the same goes for the data sets that go into this because for years I've shot, you know, uh, you know film data sets next to digital camera data sets to get the, the input and output pairs. And, you know, I, I didn't stop with the first time I did that, I refined the data sets themselves. Um, but then the important thing is what do you do with the data set, which is another reality testing thing, because um, you certainly don't, you, you actively don't want your data set to be too dense because then it'll have noise and be, um, it won't be smooth and stuff. So the question is, in between the data points, uh, what do you actually do through, all throughout the color volume? So here, um, so just first an overview, I've got up at the top here, I take the, whatever the camera input is and bring it into my log neutral space. So like if it's a Alexa 35, it's gonna go through one transformation to get to the neutral space. And if it's a, a traditional Alexa, it's gonna go through another, or if it's some other camera, 
from another manufacturer, Sony or Red, it's gonna go through yet another. Um, to, to, and, and I do my own comprehensive transformation to get them to be actually the same, not nominally the same, because again, reality checking, you know, when we have like ACEs, IDTs, and some of the manufacturer um, things uh, in, in transforms that bring it into nominal neutral spaces uh, like ACEs or XYZ or whatever. A lot of these are nominal matches only, like they're truly only in name, like they don't make anything look the same, not even a gray patch, let alone all the complicated color stuff. So I have my own um, uh, stack here for, for matching the cameras. And then this part of the stack is the look part where we have both the 3D and the 1D stuff going on. And uh, so for example, for the, th for the 3D, um, and none of this, uh, I'm showing you this in Nuke, but none of this is Nuke specific. It's all pure math that could be ported to any other platform. You know, so for example, uh, in this matching part where I'm bringing um, the one camera into the you know uh, neutral, same neutral space as another camera, um, for the uh, you know there's the one D part of the matching, the tonal, tonal reproduction part of the matching, but there's the three D, which is this thing, which is my own thing that I made called Chroma Warper, which is like a thousand lines of code here, and. Um, you can see that it's it's going to change our color volume in all these sort of nuanced curved ways. So on the one hand, it gets all the nuance of what's different about the sensors, at least in an in a, um, overall sense, um, but it's not sledgehammering anything. You know, and you know the 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 most usual uh, uh, the most usual way to do these kind of transformations is a color matrix, which only allow you can't do anything with a matrix other than stretch and squeeze and skew, but everything's always going to stay crystalline, equally spaced, linear-ish. You know, not you can't have localized little swoops and curves. You can't have one, you know, you can't have one color going one way and another color going another way. Like for example, you can't have saturated reds getting less saturated, but um, so you, you can't have highly saturated reds getting less saturated and low saturated reds getting more. All of it's either getting saturated or unsaturated, ju just as an example. So, you know, using something like this is a way to get all of these you know, additional nuances and same thing. Uh, so that's in the camera matching part. And then, then in the look part, um, I have another thing that's also custom because this thing that I call Chroma Warper that I made, uh, again, real, reality checking, like I didn't just make it and say I'm done. I had kept working on it and working on it. Um, you know, it's, it's designed, although it's nuanced and has all of this stuff, it's designed in a specific way that's better for matching to digital cameras um, while they're still in the uninterpreted original camera space. But down here is the look where I'm trying to, to um, follow the data set and, the, and also the uh, aesthetic feel of a traditional film print system where it's not just um, matching to linear sensors um, in, in an, you know, in an uninterpreted space. It's also uh, putting the look on, which, which needs a different kind of curvature and nuance and stuff. So I actually have a different um, thing. So it's a totally different math that also does a similar type of doing complex, swoopy, but not destructive or too aggressive stuff all throughout the color volume um, to match the data set. Um, and then, so, so I, you know, I slowly figure this all out. I'm always refining it. What order do I do it in? Do I do the 3D stuff before the 1D stuff? What math do I use? Um, and, and so forth. And again, always checking it on, um, on all of these images that I have, making sure it does, it's never gonna break, it's never gonna fall apart. Um, and, uh, and then also looking at it on graphs like this graph or, um, 
here's a here's a uh, here's a one uh, D graph of the tone curve, and you know checking for, you know all we, again reality checking like I make sure that it's all smooth and nothing is going to break, and you know just as an example there's a um, uh, sorry there was a uh, a, a recent colleague uh, I have a left from, and this is this is like a very, uh, you know, this is a full-on Hollywood movie. They're doing everything right. This isn't amateur hour. Um, but, you know, they their LUT was, when I looked at it, um, uh, sorry. It's got these, these ripples in it, and it's got a flat line here and a notch. And you know, it's probably usually gonna look fine, but this stuff can become visible. If you have a very smooth gradient, you might see this, you know, especially in graphics, because remember, everything has to go through the show light, even the, not just photograph stuff, but also like the, the opening title sequence and everything. And then, you know, here, you could end up seeing notching um, especially on uh, newer monitors that can that can show gradients all the way down to full black. Um, so just always, you know, again, just always uh, checking, tearing, complexity, toe handling. Is this really what I want? Is this contrast actually what I want? Um, because another thing that's uh, happening in, you know, very real, this is not a hypothetical, um, uh, not a hypothetical analogy or a hypothetical situation, something that I know of, you know, uh, multiple real life examples of is, um, you know, uh, people will, will light with the manufacturer LUT on set and the, ma and the manufacturer LUT is relatively it's perceptually flat. It's not technically flat, but perceptually it's flat. Um, like, you know, if we can compare, uh, sorry, got, uh, oh boy, I'm going over on time here. Um, Okay, so this, this, like, this is my um, color transformation that I use in my LUT, and that's the manufacturer one. Now, to me, this, this, this looks comparative compared to other manufacturer LUTs, it might look great, but to me, this looks, personally, this looks clinical and electronic and kind of antiseptic. And this looks more cinematic and more like the visual artistry and artful tonal rendering instead of uh, clinical that I, that I prefer. Um, so if you actually prefer this, that's totally fine. But the problem is the not vetting, not doing all the reality checking, going all the way down through the pipeline, and then saying, hey, this looks flat. And the, But the problem is um, because, you, see, I didn't, I didn't actually light the movie to this lot. I, I lit it to this one, right? So if, if you were lighting to this one, then if you were trying to make it look like this, but you were seeing that on the monitor, you would have put negative fill or underexposed to try to get this side of his face dark, but you can't really do that with this LUT because this LUT, it, it, on the one hand, it has full black, but it rises out of full black right away and there's no long filmy toe to it. So um, if, if you underexposed trying to do this, but with this LUT, then what you've done is you put all the tones so close together that you no longer have all these variations that, that, that I got here. And then that, and that's a very, very real world, not hypothetical example of not, not fully, you know, t taking something that's off the shelf. It, it's fine to take something that's off the shelf that you didn't do, but if you don't truly um, 
reality check it, you can get into all kinds of pitfalls and what's going on and frustrations and you know, all of your time and resources are going into damage control instead of into t making, going from better to best. Um, and uh, um, going way over on time, so just to move on. So that's, um, that's like a quick flyover of the development that I do on a lot over the years in between projects, not for a specific project. I'll come back in a minute to doing it for a specific project. But let's look at the same for um, intrapixel, uh, I mean, sorry, for uh, spatial and temporal stuff. So, um, so it's the same thing where I've, uh, you know, for years I've been creating and refining my own algorithms. But again, you know, if you don't want to make your own or, uh, you know, clearly most people are not going to make their own algorithms, but that doesn't mean you can't vet the algorithms that you are going to use because what we're the whole, my whole point here is just because somebody says something, does something, somebody says the word print, uh, film print emulation doesn't mean that automatically your movie's going to look like it was shot on, shot on film and printed in a traditional photochemical system just because somebody said the word um, uh, film print emulation. You have to actually vet things and see what they're doing. Um, so um, I've got the stuff that I do is, um, or that I have options to do that I've made algorithms for are focus vignette, which is a defocus around the edges like anamorphic lenses do. Palation, um, like, just like at the edges, like, like uh, film does when the uh, light shines through the emulsion, uh, hits the base, bounces back, and then hits it, uh, exposes the emulsion again, but unfocused. Um, curvature, which is, uh, uh, I should probably show you some of the stuff while I'm saying it, um, but, uh, you know, so the, the curvature is similar to anamorphic, the way that anamorphic lenses are not rectilinear, but, uh, you know, straight lines appear slightly curved, um, and film grain. So again, I vet these every way I can, I make sure it always looks good and that I'm not, you know, whether it's my algorithm or somebody else's, I'm gonna make sure it really does always look like, you know, cause I've seen halation type algorithms that look really electronic and I don't want that, you know, and the focus vignette is also a very good example where, you know, it's easy to blur the edges and then make a key, uh, like a, you know, like a power window key that feathers off. But if you do that, you, that's going to look incredibly electronic. That's going to look like a, a 1990s commercial where they used to key the highlights back over the image because you have a blurred image and a non-blurred image and you're cross-dissolving them. That is totally different. A gradient that's a cross-dissolve between uh, uh, defocus and not defocus is totally different than a gradient that's just different levels of defocus at every point um, in the in the thing, you know, at every point in the in the gradient. So this is this is a really good shot for vetting the focus vignette because it's kind of a worst case scenario where you know there's a lot of shots where somebody's head is in is kind of in the middle and everything all around them is blurry, so you can't even see the focus vignette. But in this shot, our main character is fully in focus. He's at the bottom of the frame, and not only that, but we have a vertical, you know, very strong vertical of his legs being dark compared to the background. And you can see what the focus vignette's doing. You see, can you see that? So I use things like this to make sure that this is gonna look good um, on absolutely everything. And I, and I, again, really vet it, and I make sure that it's, um, you know, that it's satisfying to me that this is, this all looks artful and analog and filmy and, um, you know, and not electronic or, or, um, uh, f fakely affected, um, because that's the danger. It doesn't automatically look good again, just cause you say the, the magic incantation, uh, it's all about checking and checking. Uh, so I'll just quickly give an example of 
okay, so I've done all this work over the years. Now what do I do uh, when, um, uh, you know, when, a, uh, when I start a specific show? So I'll give you a, a real life example, which is, oh, I, I didn't finish. Also Gateweave. Gateweave is here. It's separate from the, uh, this one has the focus vignette halation curvature grain. Um, so just uh, curvature, right, grain, right, and then uh, you guys have all seen, I actually used this one to show the halation in the, uh, oh, this is set up for a different, oh. yeah, there we go. Um, There's the halation. Okay, so when I started, I just did a movie uh, at the end of last year called Winter, uh, and we just did all of the finishing on it recently. Um, and I just wanna like quickly go over it, this example of um, how on the one, you know, when, when I developed the stuff for that show, um, on the one hand, again, I'm doing all of this reality checking, but on the other hand, um, at least it's not as much work to do the reality checking because I've done the bigger reality checking over the stuff that I've done over the years, so I'm not wasting my prep time on that movie uh, doing stuff that's general as opposed to specific. So, um, so I'm not going to change any of the kind of core, complicated, complex stuff in the lot, all of this stuff I was showing you, the cone coordinates, and the chroma warper and all of this kind of complex stuff that I've developed over the years, I'm gonna, just gonna not change any of that for, for this specific movie. Um, but what I am gonna do is propose to the director a subjective tweak that's not based on, um, that's not based on, uh, you know, the, the film data sets. It's just a, hey, I would like to do this like I'm making my own film stock instead of emulating the existing one, which is I proposed making the shoulder more neutral because in the real film data set that I have, that this is based on, uh, so a lot of you know that cro color crossover is a hallmark of a photochemical system, uh, you know, not just shooting film, but a whole print system where you shoot film and print onto film. And this, Based on the data set, it, there's actually two crossovers. The, the channels cross here, and then they cross again uh, up at the top. So see, they're crossing here, and then they cross again there. Um, so this was just an idea to make the, the shoulder a little more neutral and to take, over the, take out the second crossover. Um, and it was just a subjective idea. But the thing that's nice about it is it's, it's fairly superficial it's not getting down into the core of, of all of this other complex stuff that's going on. So of course I'm still gonna reality check it by looking at it on lots of different shots and everything, but it's not, it, it's not you know, digging down to the roots of the thing and, break, and, and breaking it and starting over. So I know that all of the other reality checking I've already done over the years um, still applies. And then otherwise this is the same Otherwise, this LUT is the same as the LUT that I used on the previous movie. And same thing over here, which was I proposed a few changes. I said, hey, um, what do you think about the idea of not doing a film style halation and instead uh, doing a more optical style one that looks like it could be from a lens. And, and by the way, one, another one of the reality checks that I did in building this halation algorithm is to make sure that it doesn't overall ever look like it's blurring or defocusing the image. Um, what, it, you know, what it's doing is making sure that you can't have something that's high frequency and high contrast at the same time, but it's not any kind of an overall uh, defocus because I don't want to because you see if I just turn it on and off here it doesn't look like the image is blurring or anything but I'm sure you'll probably see it I don't know you can't see it very well on that one we need something more sharply defined you can see it there very well it's not allowing this stuff here 
It's both high frequency and high contrast, but it's not overall blurring the image at all. Um, so I proposed to the director this idea of, of slightly changing. I, I rewrote the algorithm a little and then also changed the, the already existing parameters in it to make it look a more op like it's an optical halation instead of a film halation, so it doesn't have the red anymore. So we made that change, and that wasn't... Again, I vetted that and looked at it on lots of shots, but because I'd already vetted the halation algorithm itself over years, I didn't have to dig as deep into doing the whole thing because um, I'd done that before I was uh, billing that production for my time and uh, not wasting their time on that. Um, same thing with the curvature is the curvature, um, you know, we have it set to use the metadata in the, in the camera file. It uses the focal length and there's a slightly different amount of curvature depending on the angle of view of the lens. And the, the way I do it is sort of for all the medium and, and semi-wide lenses, it's kind of the same amount of curvature that you would get for the same angle of view on anamorphic. Um, remember, the same angle of view is going to be a different focal length um, on different formats. Um, but when you get to really wide lenses, it doesn't do as much as anamorphic would, because to me that actually gets distracting. Instead of being artful, it actually becomes a little bit affected and distracting. Um, so we, we changed, so I didn't change the algorithm itself. Uh, from the previous movie, but what we did change is we slightly changed the parameters of how much of it do you get per um, angle of view. We made it where you get a tiny bit more on the widest lenses. Um, and then the grain we uh, chose, so on winter, uh, we chose a grain level that I'd already used, but it was different than the glass onion um, theatrical version. Uh, so that had already been vetted. And then we decided not to do the gate weave at all. Um, so obviously we don't have to vet not using the gate weave. Um, and uh, so, uh, sorry to make that part of it so quick, but uh, uh, I think I'm already longer, <laughs> way longer than we're supposed yeah, to be. Slightly. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty mm -hmm. much it. And and you know, so the so again, I, you know, hopefully the main takeaway here is no matter where you are on that continuum, you know, th that I mentioned, you know, d don't forget that this stuff actually happens no matter what. Right, it's just, do you have anything to do with it? Are you, are you involved in authoring it and checking it and rea you know, reality checking it and vetting it? Or are you just got sort of letting something happen to you? Because I've had people say to me, why do you do all this stuff? Why don't you just shoot film? And that word just in that sentence to me is just ridiculous because you know, sure, you're not doing all the development, but thousands of scientists and engineers at Kodak and Fuji and labs have been working on this forever somebody is vetting it, just not you. Um, you know, and now, now that we, do, we don't do that, nobody does that process anymore. You know, even if you shoot film, it still gets scanned, so you're still open to all of the pitfalls about what LUT are you using and um, all the digital interpretation stuff. So this is, all of this stuff is something that's happening. It's just whether, whether you're actually taking control of it or not. Um, so hopefully this is, uh, you know, inspiration to to, to uh, get involved in that, no matter what it is. Whether it's you want to do it yourself, like I do, you want to partially do it yourself, where you get components and make it. You want to collaborate with a color scientist at a post house, or even just using off the shelf stuff, but being really rigorous about about checking and vetting, and and making sure you're not um, falling victim to placebo effect and and um, uh, confirmation bias. Wow, thank you. I just thought, did you ever meet Christopher Nolan and have a chat about doing everything photochemically? Um, I could hear question marks popping up over their heads in the audience all the way through the room. But I would love to keep your questions for the end, where we hopefully still have some time for that. Um. Uh, yeah, thanks. That was absolutely great, and uh, such an attention to detail. Um, Ari, perhaps you could give us, share with us 
how you approach the look, but step back a little bit and relate how you go about um, linking the look development with the content um, of your project. Oh, sorry, hi. Yeah, um, so thanks so much for that, Steve. That's awesome. I could listen to that all day <laughs> and more. Um, and I think um, what I was going to talk about has kind of a bit of crossover and is, is complementary. And what I really loved about what you're think, saying, Steve, is it's about being, I guess, thorough and that um, you can either be involved with something meaningfully or you can either leave, or leave it to chance. And for people like us that are thorough, the idea of leaving something to chance is feels like, <laughs> I don't know, the wor kind of the worst possible outcome. Um, so, um, yeah, can you see my screen there, hopefully? Um, so basically, um, a few years ago I got asked to do a... A kind of similar talk and to share with students some of my um, some of the processes I go through, some of the things I think about in prep. And so I made this big kind of document, um, which um, you guys will have access to. It's basically it's a it's not a full list, but it's kind of just and it's not in any particular order, but it's it's just a long list of all different things that um, I guess they're variables or they're some of them are um, things like framing and colour, other th things are more like, um, I guess, more like storytelling type um, type things. Anyway, it goes on and on and I kind of occasionally add to it or, or update it um, and I encourage students to kind of add their own thoughts. But um, I guess I don't really refer to this list myself, this is more kind of inside my mind when I'm, I'm starting to prep. Um, so I thought I'd just go through, um, yeah, I guess my, my uh, philosophy or the way I think about prepping a, a film um, on a, a less technical, um, or the other side of it from what Steve was chatting about. Um, so I thought I'd just kind of touch on briefly, like why, you know, again, why bother with all this stuff? Um, if it's not obvious, I mean, we're all pretty passionate about it. <laughs> given the audience we've got here today, but I mean, I, I enjoy it obviously a huge amount. Um, but I think overall, like a look, it gives so much information to a viewer about um, the atmosphere, the tone, even kind of the budget, you know, whether you're gonna manipulate that to make something look more expensive than it is or, or look like more lo-fi than it, than it really is. Um, how serious, I guess, the film is, um, and the sense of place, and basically you're kind of manipulating a viewer's experience, and ideally, for me, what I love about film, one of the things I love about film is it's kind of like time travel, and hopefully someone watching it will kind of go into a cinema or at home and, and kind of disappear into this world you've created for them. So I really think the look has a huge part of that. Um, a huge amount of the ability to time travel. It's going to be something different than what we see, you know, when we take a photo on our phone or just in our day-to-day -day lives. So it's manipulated, which is satisfying to watch because it's a kind of escapist experience. But And then I think number one, it's kind of, it influences the viewer emotionally. Um, it's kind of obvious to say, but, um, and I think it's important to understand that because you're going to take someone on a journey and a very specific journey that has to do with your script and your characters. And, and I guess for these reasons above, I would say that um, just because you love the look of another film, um, you can't kind of hope that that look will work for your film because uh, those t every film has got different priorities and different um, what it's trying to do to a viewer. So yeah, uh, a look from another film is not gonna work for your film, um, and so I'll go through kind of how today, how I kind of, yeah, bring, uh, get to that, to that point. Um, um, and then kind of what contributes, and I would argue that everything in frame contributes to the look, um, not just what we do, um, but the design, the locations, absolutely everything. And, and I think they actually contribute in equal measure. So 
Um, I've written here, like, I'd argue that the colour of or, like, the type of car in the background of the film has, has equal kind of weight and influence on that information and that experience of viewers getting just as much as the lenses you choose. Each of those kind of elements are bits of information that we are kind of unconsciously ingesting. Um, and um, I think, uh, yeah, I would definitely agree with with Steve in that there's a lot of thought kind of given to the, the camera body or even the, the lenses and, and often that's, um, yeah, a little bit of kind of marketing and a little bit of, uh, uh, yeah, I think we'd all like to hope if we use a particular camera or a particular lens then our film's going to look a particular way but actually I would argue that they're kind of one of the more minor factors in, um, in the overall final result and, and the viewer's experience. Um, and so, yeah, if everything contributes, which I believe it does, um, it's also our responsibility as a DP to kind of communicate and, and be part of a bigger conversation about uh, with the designers, production designer, location scout, the effect supervisor, producer, anyone that's kind of, um, well, I guess everyone on the film is involved with how it's looking. So. Um, this conversation is not one you can have in a vacuum with the director and hope that you're going to get the result you want because, uh, yeah, I think it's obvious to say that uh, just camera department or you alone will not make the look. It's going to involve communication. And, and part of that communication is not just saying what your ideas are, but, but hearing back what feedback you're getting from other people's ideas and, and whether or not that idea is going to be possible in the situation you're in. Um, and really taking that on board, I would say, to not, um, you know, by no means kind of let you get self get pushed around by someone, but also um, accepting the reality that you're in as soon as possible. Um, and because not every look is possible in every situation, but I think a good look is possible in every situation. You've got to find the, the right look for both your script and the resources you have. Um, and that's really important for me as well because I am big on a kind of harmonious um, set and um, you want to avoid at all costs kind of putting your vision for your look on a collision course with your budget or your um, schedule or even the director's kind of priorities. So um, very much not the vacuum. Um, so then I started thinking as well about this idea of a look um, and I guess I would say I don't, when I'm prepping a film, I don't even really, it's not a look that I'm trying to um, build or, or conceive of. It's kind of, that's one aspect, but it's, for me it's more of a philosophy of how we're gonna shoot this film. Um, and I think a, a philosophy is more of a, it's a more powerful concept than a look in a way because it's how we get to the look. The look will come. Um, uh, I guess it, yeah, it will. It'll come via the natural things that happen when you when you kind of think of these guidelines that, or or a philosophy. And the great thing about a philosophy as well is is it's going to be able to answer your questions that are going to come up as the film shoot goes on. So, um, for me, what is a philosophy? It's kind of basically what we do or don't do on this film, um, based on. Um, yeah, what we want the viewer's experience to be and that journey they're going to go on. Um, yeah, the, the restrictions, um, all those kind of things that directors, natural taste. Um, and they're kind of going to be a, a kind of hope or a rule um, that, for example, yeah, we, if we hope if we do X idea that for the viewer that's going to create X kind of experience. Um, Sort of shown examples is from that choices list um, about that um, the philosophy. Something like, uh, for example, a film I did a few years back, um, Lady Macbeth. Um, I think we did pretty well on our philosophy there. Um, and I would say some of the ideas we had were um, a kind of coverage concept was a big idea, or a coverage rule for us. It was. Um, that we weren't going to tilt or pan whenever this character was kind of trapped inside the, the mansion that she was in or she was under surveillance. So people would stand up and, and leave frame and come and um, 
move around in the frame, but we would not tilt or pan. And then when she was not um, being surveilled, um, we would go kind of the opposite direction, handheld, move with her. Um, and yeah, we'd always put the camera at her eye height if possible um, and put her in the center of frame where possible. And we also didn't see, we decided not to see the outside of the location we're in, only the inside in the same way that um, a prisoner would not see the outside of the prison. Um, so they're kind of, that would be the concept and, and the reason behind doing that was that um, we wanted to create a really strong alliance with the viewer to this character um, as early on as possible because uh, later in the film she starts to do some kind of very bad things and the experience we wanted for the viewer was to attach themselves to this character, feel like they like them via these um, kind of concepts we had. So they're attached to this character and then at a certain point the character that they love starts doing bad things and that creates the feeling that we wanted for the audience which was like, Ugh, I don't know how I feel about this person that I really like doing things I don't like. And, and obviously there's a lot to do with the performance and script and that uh, uh, helping that but um, in order to support that we, um, they were some of the ideas we had um, to do that. And, also about the reality we were in, um, we, truth be told, we didn't have an exterior of that location that worked. The interior was great, but it was a location where the exterior didn't, uh, it wasn't perfect. So we, um, again, there's, a, there's an example of how the reality of the situation you're in, you can kind of take that and use it as a strength. Um, we also only had four weeks to shoot, so we shot very minimal coverage, which kind of became part of our concept or our philosophy to shoot the shot, shoot every scene in the bare minimum number of shots, kind of usually about three shots per scene. Um, and that um, was one of the philosophies we uh, decided to do and also worked for the schedule because we had very little time. So I guess there's a few examples of how um, uh, the, ideally those choices that you make in that big long list, they'll be both going to work for the script and for the reality you're in. And sometimes a challenge that you come up against, um, you can kind of embrace it, grab it and make it part of your philosophy that's going to help you out. Um, another thing in that film we couldn't afford, uh, I don't think we could afford a dolly or a, a dolly grip, so we decided not to ever move the camera at all apart from handheld so um and uh yeah i'd say it's a pretty strong look um those decisions are pretty strong um pretty visible but um uh i think they yeah that was one i would say was was a success um and yeah so just to reiterate that of all these choices that are in that list, the camera body itself and the lenses, I think they're pretty, for me, um, they're not the most influential um, in how your film will look. And that's not to say I don't, I love, um, the, I love lenses and I love cameras obviously, but um, they are part of a bigger ecosystem. They're not king in the, um, the kind of hierarchy of influence, I would say. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd touch on how I kind of personally prepare. Um, yes. Um, yeah, it's funny, um, we don't really get to, DPs don't get to uh, see each other work very often, so to be honest I have no idea if this is stock standard, totally boring or interesting <laughs> in any way, but um, <laughs> maybe everyone's yeah. doing it differently, maybe similarly, but um, I guess I'll, yeah. Oh, this is how I do it. So, um, well, thank you. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> um, reading the script and talking to the director, um, I'd say most directors would come with some some kind of ideas about how they want the film to look, or what their natural taste is in general. Um, but aside from that, in those early talks, or, or as I'm getting to know a director, I'm really trying to find out. Um, What's their, what do they love, what do they fear, what are they, what's their worst nightmare, what's a great day on set look like for them, what's, what's, a, what's 
the situation they most fear getting into. And, and you know, you might be asking yourself, what's that got to do with the look? And it's like, well, if a director's worst nightmare is feeling like there's so much gear in the room, I can't look where I want, and I feel like I'm on a film set and the actors can't, you know, just like feel kind of uh, claustrophobic that there's so much stuff, then um, you a look that's kind of very lit or very um, polished is probably not going to be right for this project because you're setting yourself on a collision course with this director who's trusted you to support them. Um, and then if you see that collision course coming, um, I would say trust that kind of red flag feeling you get you get and, and start thinking of it as a um, as an exciting challenge for you. Um, this is a real example by the way of, of a director I worked with who had a very strong allergy, I would call it allergy to film lights. Um, so we found a way around that by um, he was very supportive of finding locations that worked for natural light. And, um, and, and, and was very disciplined in his time of day. He wouldn't kind of go over time knowing that the light in this location is going to change or get bad at a certain time or we can only shoot here during daylight. Um, and then a lot of built-in lighting that I worked with the art department to build um, pracs and kind of strip lighting and going around the top of curtains and basically anywhere that we could add light to have the option later. And I think on the whole shoot, I maybe used one film light one day where we really um, ran out of time um, outside, that's, not inside. So, that's um, kind of a cue for me. Yeah. <laughs> because we're running out of time here okay. as well. So. <laughs> yeah, no <worries. laughs> um, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, it also touches upon topics that we um, started to discuss before here with Pascal, like before the session. But um, can we go to my presentation? Because that handout that you've seen wasn't, yep, wasn't yet shared uh, with all of you, but you can have that. It's an eight page PDF, camera choices. Maybe you should have put a watermark in there. I expect this <laughs> now to float around the internet forever. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I, magical about it. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. obvious bits and pieces. Yes, and I um, talked with some, some that, like, uh, mentioning it that they had similar lists and similar to the image attributes that Steve mentions on his color science article. I believe the most important thing is that you come up with these kind of lists and build your own vocabulary build your own terminology, how to describe images, how to describe the look, and so on. So, um, with a few minutes left that we have, Pascal, give us a quick introduction of what kind of projects you're working on, and how, what do you take also about these different approaches? I mean, we had a very kind of narrow look in the image processing pipeline in Uke that Steve built for years. We had a little broader perspective on how to approach a project with a director, um, how does this apply to your line of work? Well, I work on, uh, on features, usually low budget, often first time features for the directors. Uh, I also work on documentaries and, uh, and some, some short films also. And um, I can rely very much about what Ari said. But I would say that the discussion when it's a first time director are um, uh, maybe not more precise, but they take longer because I have to extract the, the, the relevant information to build the look. They don't always have the, um, the vocabulary. And so it's almost like gold digging. I have to, to make uh, a very... Um, I have to be a very careful listener to get rid of all the irrelevant information. Like, for example, what, what, what Steve was talking about, the, this camera is looking like I like. It's something I can hear a lot, and I know it's, I, I know it's not true. So I have to find other ways 
to find what, what really is the look, and then the choice of the camera is something very secondary. And how do you try to find out? Can you, in that pro or the, on the projects that you do, um, create like, um, do you do what I like to call these days look tests? Because it's I try to. many projects more than just the hair and makeup. Because in the end, you also got to do the, uh, we only should test lenses, but in the end, you're supposed to do, as a colorist, a lookup table for the whole show with that. Yeah, absolutely. The, le the, the test we make, if it's camera test or lens te test, are usually to get images in common, even more when it's a first relation, and, um, and to talk precisely about things. And um, when I don't uh, get uh, the time from the production, uh, usually I do it for free, because I know I will be the most frustrated of all if it doesn't happen. And um, getting uh, a little bit of uh, the color palette, uh, maybe an actor, uh, some lights, to be in what we discussed before, but what would be the mood of the script. And so to have images we can go and see on a big screen with a color artist to build the look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm joining the club of being very frustrated if it doesn't happen, so I also have offered this to production, or to at least cinematographers when they approach me and say, here, I had very little time to shoot anything at all. Can you help me to maybe do something like a lookup table, just evaluate the footage, and then I'm usually saying, yeah, even if you can't pay me for that, I'm happy to do that. We still need to find a facility, a grading suite, and so on. But um, my experience is it, the whole production just benefits from this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> at, at every step during the shooting, if you, have, if you have a consistent look, something that pleases the director, pleases you, pleases the production, because it's all in accord with what everybody wants to do, the best film possible, then, yeah, it saves a lot of time on set, a lot of money, because it, we don't lose time. And it can save a lot of time in post as well. When, when do you contact the colorist? How, how early do you get engage a colorist? As soon as I can. I mean, when I know I'm, I'm the one that will do the project, I already think about post, and so contacting somebody that, we, that I can include in all the info I get from the direction, and giving the color palette, uh, the, the, the contrast, the, the visual references, and then we are two to work <laughs> to achieve the film. And do you make that call, or is it uh, a post-super or somebody who introduces you to the colorist? How does that come about? Uh, it depends. Sometimes the, the production wants a specific lab and they can have somebody that is uh, like a permanent person. It happens. But some of the time it's a freelance and then I get to choose. Okay, cool, cool. And uh, what about the director? How involved is the director in terms of the, the technical details? Do you, sh do you share those as well? Um, yeah, depending on their, their level of technicity, but I try to be as pedagogic as possible because uh, I think when they understand what the topic is about, they get involved. If they feel like two person talking things they don't get, um, they, I mean, they, they feel bad first. It's like uh, getting robbed of your movie, so I don't think it's a good thing. Yeah, I like to pose that question also to Steve and Ari, actually. When and how do you start collaborating with a colorist? Is it similar for you? I guess, Steve, you still need a colorist in the end. <laughs> but you give him yeah. your pipeline somehow? Yeah, of course. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the thing is, it's not, you know, I do have this stuff all buttoned up, and I, but it's not to, I mean, it's the opposite of, of taking away what a colorist does. It's letting them do their magic because, you know, we have a limited time in the grade and everything already is our look. So they, they can just do their thing. And, and do all the nuances and really make it look beautiful. They're not wasting the time on damage control and re, you know, reinventing the wheel uh, on, on every shot. Um, also, also, this isn't answering the question, but I just wanted to say that something that Ari said was absolutely 
brilliant and so condensed, which is the that sentence. Um, uh, what was it exactly? I think he said, um, uh, "Not not every movie can have any look, but every movie can have a great look." And I mean that is, I mean that that's the seed of so many different important things where people try to shoehorn something that's wrong in, and it's just not what it wants to be. Whether whether it's a whether it's a big picture idea like, hey, I want it to look like some specific movie, or whether it's a, even it's a, it could be this a small detailed thing where the DP's or the gaffer's trying to shoehorn the key to be on one side when the window's on the other side or whatever, but that, that kind of going against thing, what something wants to be because of getting something stuck in your head. I mean, that just, but the way you said that is just that such a great condensation of it. It's just brilliant. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably the same in that I, yeah, would try and get a colorist on um, as soon as possible to start probably talking about, for me, it's like talking about some of the challenges maybe that um, that we might be facing, some of them, or maybe some of the challenges that I hadn't realized were gonna be challenges. Often talking to a colorist, something I've been losing sleep over will actually not be such an issue. They'll say, don't worry about that, um, or let's test that. Um, and yeah, give, having someone to kind of guide a little bit what to test, because there's so many things you could test and you can test every variable together and lose your mind in the number of changing elements. Um, but a colorist is really great to kind of get some guidance on in this, with this specific project, what should we, what would be really important to test? Um, that, uh, yeah, I um, definitely enjoy having a, someone early on to talk to because also as a DPs, we're a little bit uh, lonely in prep in that we're a kind of a one person department until our, um, you know, sometimes until right just before the tech scout. Um, uh, so having someone else that gets it and the person that's gonna be dealing with the footage that you create in the very end, um, I feel like often the colorist is kind of, can be your kind of prep sidekick um, if you have someone that you can talk to, um, yeah, early on before you've got um, your other crew kind of around. Mm -hmm. We just hit it exactly, except that we officially doesn't, don't have time left for Q&A. So we have a look in the corner. Are you feeling OK? If we yeah? OK, so I would love to open up to questions. And I have, can I steal maybe your microphone and we can pass it around? Thanks. Do you think something will come in the near future to bring the spatial and temporal aspects on the set, like grain inhalation, so we look through the viewfinder and see our own individual grain we created in pre-production and also halation, for example? I know there's the Ari Alexa 35 with the textures, but that's only one manufacturer. Uh, I guess. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's no reason you, that stuff can't be live, but also, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it doesn't take a whole lot, lot of technology that we don't have, even if it's not actually implemented right now. It's very doable, but to me, I also just don't know why we actually <laughs> need that because it's such a it's such a last tiny little bit of finesse on it, and it's not really affecting any uh, decisions that we're going to be making on set. Um, so I think absolutely there's no reason that it wouldn't be possible, but also it's not anything that I'm sorely missing or, 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 or uh, chomping at the bit for. I can just add to that that um, there are pipelines where we can add that, maybe not on set directly, but in the lab so that it's carried through um, the editorial dailies and so on. We generally don't put it on for the visual effects for obvious reasons, um, but, but you can put that spatial stuff on the dailies so that it goes through editorial. Yeah, we already do that. Yeah, we do. We do that. We do everything but the halation on the dailies. We do all the other. We do grain, grain weave, um, curvature, and the focus vignette if we're going to do it on the dailies. Just not the halation because it's a little bit heavier of a render. But yeah, but but live, but live on set, uh, don't do any of it. But cer certainly possible, not beyond the scope of computational power. Just there's no off-the-shelf machine to do it right now. But. Um, I don't, I don't miss it, though. <laughs> More questions? 
there is one. Maybe you can. Maybe it's faster to pass it behind you. Um, it was uh, really nice to hear Ari's uh, philosophies towards, like, uh, just like creating the look. Um, I was just wanting to maybe hear, like, the other DPs sort of philosophies that they might have had. Um. Pascal, you want to go first? Yep. Well, <laughs> what kind of philosophy? Uh, but it depends on the movie. Uh, Ari was saying, and uh, she's, uh, she's very right, that uh, it's about what you decide you do for this film and what you don't do. So it can really... Uh, I, I think I, I told you today that... Uh, I like when a director I worked with say to me after seeing a movie made my, by me but by, with another director that he cannot recognize what I did. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I changed my philosophy movie life, for each movie. Mm -hmm. Steve, you want to talk about the, like yeah. maybe also how, how do you uh, come to yeah. those decisions for your pipeline for a specific project? Yeah. Well, I think uh, some of what Ari was saying was actually really inspirational to me because it's some of it's exactly my philosophy, but that I don't always have the best language for. So I really like listening to you uh, <laughs> uh, talk about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, to me, I do think that the that a lot of the things that are the look, are, you know, just emerge from who you are trying to do just trying to just trying to tell the story the best visual way possible to really to really bring it home visually. Um, it, so instead of sort of in advance saying these are the rules that I'm going to use to make a look, um, I think that's the that, that's just um, handicapping yourself. If you just don't make any rules and you're like I'm we're just going to try to figure out how to tell this story the most visually impactful way, it's automatically going to have a look because it's because it's you doing it. One more question, anywhere? Uh, maybe there first. Da, 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 da. Uh, raise your hand again so we can pass it through the row. Hi there. Nice to see you at the presentation. I would like to ask you, it's more maybe a, uh, a question for the set, when you work on the set. Uh, if you see some kind of lighting, if you right now on the set said, oh, that's going to work with my workflow, or oh, that's not going to work. I'm not on set, so who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, okay. what, do you, what do you mean by work, okay. lighting and workflow? Yeah, because I work like a gaffer, so I'm asking about the lighting. So if you have in mind some mood or whatever, you said uh, with the gaffer some lighting and you see on a set mm -hmm. the picture and you said right now on a set, oh, that's not going to work in the post-production or ah, I can do it in post-production. Oh. If it's correct. Yeah I, yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, uh, for me, I, like, there isn't really anything that technically doesn't work really. I mean, we don't have a lot of technical restrictions. It really is just the artistry of, is, is this what you're after? And for the most part, I'm not going to say we never do an about face, but for the most part, we're always honing in on it. We don't light it and then say, oh, this isn't what we want at all. Let's, let's change it. We're all, we're kind of know what we want. Cause if, if, if you spiral, you're really making bad use of your resources. And, and, um, you know, there's a reason that, that, uh, that, you, that you're given the job, you're supposed to make it better. Cause there's a lot of people could do it if they were given infinite time to spiral. You have to do it in the actual time given. I think from my point of view as a colorist, um, the big difference from in, in lighting is everything in post-production is really going to be two-dimensional and based on the frame of the image. So the lighting's critical where you have to create shadows. So like a vignette, for example, you don't want to do that in lighting, you want to do that in post. But if you want direction of the light that we can work with in post, you've got to create those shadows for us to see and to work with. Um, so, so we kind of think of it slightly differently from the post end. And um, again, getting involved early is, is quite useful in setting those sort of things up. 
Then there was one last question. Yeah, my question is about the curvature tool. Um, it looked like that it brought pixels from outside, from outside the frame into the frame. Um, so this would not be possible if you compose for the entire size of a sensor, right? Because there is no information to bring in. Yeah, that's ab that's absolutely right. But we never compose for the entire with the entire canvas of a sensor. There's no reason to, to do that. You're asking for all kind of problems if you do with visual effects and um, other things. Yeah, there, there's nothing magical about the size of a sensor, right? I mean, every sensor is a different size anyway. So you just set your frame area and give yourself the pad that you need. And, and you have a rule how, how much percentage um, you use, or does it change from shot to shot depending if it's visual effects shot or not? Well, so, I mean, me, me personally, to add that curvature, we need at least 7%. So what, what I tend to do is, you know, when, when we have a bigger canvas, like, you know, it just, dep it just depends on the project and everything. But like if we're shooting open gate on an Alexa LF, we might have a bigger pad on all the normal shots. But then if we do, you know, a high speed shot at 200 frames a second on an Alexa mini, we might only have the pad we need and no additional pad. And what we do in that case is, for example, if visual effects needs, you know, visual effects needs the pad, then they can take as much of it as they need, and we either put less curvature or no curvature on just that one shot. Um, but yeah, I, I would never shoot without a pad. There's there's no, there's absolutely no argument to shoot without a pad, and there's many, 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 many reasons to shoot with a pad. So yeah, the answer is yeah, shoot with a pad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, Ari. Thank you, Steve. We have to end here. I would love to continue this session for a long time. I have many more questions, but I already told you both. Uh, please come here next year. You can reserve the, f uh, the week from the f second weekend in November next year. Just block it in your schedules now. And please come here. <laughs>